Sometimes in real estate, as a real estate agent, you come across situations where things get sticky, things get messy, and it's not obvious what you should do as the agent. So in this video, I just wanna give you something like a field guide to like, how do I make those decisions? How do I make sure that I'm doing the correct thing in any given situation? Stick around. How's it going friends? My name is Jesse Lynch. I run multiple real estate teams around the United States. And on this channel, I'm really interested in helping people who want to absolutely crush in real estate and they want to do it on their own terms. If that's you, come hang out for a while, subscribe to the channel, click the bell to get notified so you can see when these videos are coming out. We, we stay putting videos out. Remember that as like a kid? Maybe not, I don't know. That was a thing we did, uh, it was sick. If you have any interest in working with me, whether that's on my team, starting your own expansion team with kind of all the systems that I have in place, or just joining Real Broker, that's the brokerage I'm at, you can go to my website, jessylynch.co. There's a bunch of information on there about kind of like what I do, how you could potentially team up with me, the different ways things like that. And of course there's a, a contact information page there as well. It's very, very easy to fill out. So do that, get in touch. And I'd love to just have a conversation about maybe what we could be doing. So first things first, I just wanna say that this is not legal advice, okay? I'm not an attorney. I'm not pretending to be one. I, I, I am glad I'm not one. I know some really good ones. I've actually helped really good real estate attorneys move and it, that's a nerve wracking situation to be representing somebody who literally studies the law around what you're doing, which is a very legal legal situation, nerve wracking. But this sort of field guide, these basic simple instructions really help to inform every decision that I make as far as when anything gets at all complicated. So first things first, I wanna talk about the protected classes, right? Race, religion, disability, national origin, sex, marital status, familial status, age, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Some of those are only in Minnesota or they're not in every state around the country, but I think that's the huge majority of them uh, on the national level, but that's Minnesota's protected classes. That's a lot of things, right? That's a lot of things to think about and mostly, it seems easy, right? Mostly those things, it's like, well, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be discriminatory uh, uh, based on those things. But the truth is, maybe you think that, right? Maybe you know all these things, but your clients don't necessarily, right? Your clients, a lot of the time, will not necessarily know what things they can and cannot ask, so it's on you. And for one, just take this little bit of, of language with you. You can write it down or whatever. If somebody asks you for, I want to live in a neighborhood with young families, okay? First of all, I will often say, I'm like, well, that's actually two protected uh, classes, right? That's familial status and that's age, right? Young and family, right? So if I was to tell you, oh, this is a neighborhood with a lot of young families, I would be, <laughs> literally would be steering based on two protected classes and I can't do that. And so the language is basically, actually that's a protected class. And I think school does a really good job of like teaching you these concepts, but not necessarily like, exactly what do I say, right? And so the thing that I have found that I like to say when somebody asks for, you know, we wanna live in a neighborhood where there's a bunch of young families. That's a, just a really common situation that happens to me uh, with my buyer clients is I would say, actually that's two protected classes. And I would explain that both age and familial status are protected classes. And while I totally understand that that's something that you're looking for, I think there are really good ways to filter through your search and to describe the place you're looking for based on things that are not protected classes, right? We can have a conversation and get to the bottom of a neighborhood that will be the right fit for you, not based on those protected classes. Every now and then there might be somebody who maybe tries to like code the language, right? And they say, well, then can you tell me maybe where there would be a neighborhood where I would drive around and I would see like, like kids toys in the front yard and jungle gyms in the backyard. And it's like, okay, I understand. Again, I understand what you're doing. I know what that coded language is. And so I can't comment on it. But again, I think there are much better ways at arriving in a place that might be a good fit for you than these protected classes. The amount of conversations that I've had with people who are clients who maybe I have a Zoom call with, maybe I'm meeting in person with, or it's just a phone call. It, that's the, the most common is Zoom call or phone call. They're asking questions that literally make me wonder like, is this a sting? 
you're, you're, you're prodding so heavily to try to get answers based on these protected classes. Is this a sting that the DOJ or whoever would do that uh, is putting on? Because it feels so much like they're just trying to push at that. And to them, honestly, like you just have to stick to your guns. These are protected classes. I can't steer you to a location based on these protected classes. And I think a lot of people uh, intuit the idea that steering is steering people away from somewhere because it wouldn't be a good fit for somebody of that protected class. But the truth is steering somebody to a location that is good for somebody in a protected class is the same exact thing. You cannot steer people to or away from uh, an area based on any of these protected classes. And so what it takes is you having the confidence to say that and you asking them to describe other things about what are other things that are important to you in a neighborhood that are not one of these protected classes. There are a ton of measurable and uh, describable things about a neighborhood that somebody can use to explain what they're looking for. And so you can be helpful, it just can't be based on those protected classes. So repeat after me, right? Blank is a protected class. That's not something that I can comment on as a licensed real estate agent, but there are a lot of other aspects about a neighborhood that will allow us to get to the bottom of where you want to live and what would be a good fit for you, just not based on these protected classes. Okay, that was a little bit long. You didn't have to repeat after me, but you get the idea, right? Okay, so that's gonna be kind of upfront and during the search. Those are very, very common questions that can just put you in a sticky situation and just have the confidence to say that's not something I can do, but I'm still gonna be really helpful and any agent who's going to steer you based on those things is unethical and you probably wouldn't wanna work with that person anyway. And now this next part, is basically fiduciary duties, fiduciary responsibilities. These are things that you're gonna learn about in real estate class if you have not done so yet. If you have, and maybe you did this a while ago, maybe you don't remember all of them. There's the acronym old car. It's pretty easy to remember if you're thinking about it, if you're active in real estate and like thinking about these things all the time. But more importantly, I use these things as my North Star, right? I use these as a guiding force in everything that I do, and so I'm thinking about them a lot. The people who forget about them are the people who are not thinking about them a lot, and they're not sort of using those to help them make these decisions. So rely on those, lean on these fiduciary duties to explain to you what the right thing to do is. The old car acronym is obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable skill and care. When I was just starting, it was reasonable care only. Now it's reasonable skill and care, which I think is probably, probably more succinct. The first thing, this is a really helpful thing that I say all the time, it's obedience, right? And I will often say to a buyer client or a seller client, well, I owe you obedience, so dot, 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 right? So if I have a client who said, there's a house, it's listed at 500,000, I'd like to offer 400,000. What do you think about that? I might think in my heart of hearts or in my grasp of the market that that on that particular house is a long shot. It might even be, you know, snowballs, chance in hell, like, like that is not gonna happen. But you owe them obedience, right? So you, you probably want to voice your opinion of like, eh, it's probably not super likely that that's gonna get accepted, but I owe you obedience. So I'm happy to make an offer for you and we can basically make that offer and then adjust based on the response that we get, right? Not too many clients are kind of operating in that realm where they're trying to lowball like really, really bad Badly and make you do a lot of extra work, especially work that you are really confident isn't going to bear fruit for them, right? Very, that, that's pretty rare. But every now and then, there's an offer that somebody wants to write that maybe you think it's probably not that likely that that's gonna get accepted, but you owe them obedience, so just do it, right? And one thing that I think is really nice about this, it very early on, I was proven that my concept of the market can be wrong, right? I can be wrong about what I think is likely to get accepted, and I often am. Not that often anymore, right? I actually have a very good grasp of the market and all that, but still, 
the market can surprise me. And so by leaning on the obedience of like, I'll put in whatever offer you wanna put in, you can not only one, ensure your client that like you're on their team, right? You will write an offer, you learn how to write an offer, you get better at writing an offer, or you have transaction coordinators who write the offer for you. If you're in Minnesota, hit me up, I got really good transaction coordinators. But there's always the off chance that that offer is going to get accepted. And then you'll be really, really glad that you just relied on that obedience, right? That you said, wow, I really didn't think this was gonna happen, but I owe them obedience, so I put the offer in and I was surprised. Very early on, I was helping some first time home buyers or like friends of my sister. Their budget was, I wanna say maybe $230,000, which in Minnesota is not a ton, but they were buying a townhome. And there was a townhome that we saw, they'd already written three or four offers at this point. This was in 2020, market was crazy. They'd already written quite a few offers where they went well and above uh, purchase price, right? But in this particular situation, the house was listed for $215,000. Their max budget was 230. It showed really nice. It was a very nice townhome, probably nicer than everything else that they offered on. And they were like, wow, we love this house, but we're pretty sure it's probably not gonna get accepted, right? And so, and I kind of thought like, yeah, it's probably not gonna get accepted. You know, this house is really nice and it's, it's probably gonna go way over 230 even. So then we started driving home. And I started thinking about, you know, ethics. I started thinking about obedience, which I wasn't really breaking the obedience rule, but then I just kind of started to think about like the, hey, don't be a lazy asshole, right? Do the work. And so I called them. I said, hey, I know that we think that it's probably not that likely, but I still think it's worth putting in the offer. I would feel really silly if we, put, if we found out that we could have gotten it for 230. And they said, okay, cool, we appreciate that. And I said, great, let's do it. We wrote up the offer, submitted it. They got the offer accepted. I was pretty much immediately humbled and, and sobered, right? Like, hey, you're not always right. Your assumption about the market can be wrong. Your assumption about a single house can be wrong. And you can also get lucky. I, th I think they got lucky, but there is luck. Luck does exist in the market. So anyway, that's obedience. And maybe with a little bit of a tie-in of like, hey, just put in the work, right? Then the next one is loyalty. And maybe the put in the work has something to do with loyalty, but really what loyalty means is that you are on their side, right? Not just you will obey them, but you are on their side. You are representing them. And every move that you make in representation of them is with at least the very intent of being in their best interest. So no throwing them under the bus, right? I've worked with a lot of agents, a lot of, let's say, seller agents, where I'm a buyer's agent, they're a seller's agent, and somebody's saying like, yeah, my, I don't know, my seller's a real asshole, or something, I've literally had people say that, right? Or they're like, yeah, they're just really unreasonable. And while maybe that's true, right, maybe they are being really unreasonable, you owe them loyalty. And I would say throwing your client under the bus is not a particularly loyal thing to do. The next thing that you owe your client, the D in old of old car, is disclosure. It's pretty obviously what it means. It means that you will disclose things to them, but some people think it just means similar to maybe in like a seller's disclosure that you will disclose material facts to them about a house, right? If you show them a house and you see mold in the corner, right? Or you see a mouse run into the basement, right? You, you owe them that disclosure, right? It is your job to disclose the material fact that you found. But it's not just that, right? It also is disclosure related to the contract. It's also disclosure related to negotiations, right? And communications that have been sent, right? They, you want them to know kind of all the pieces at play. And I think there's like a little piece of this that I've learned the hard way, admittedly, which is disclosure upfront when you're writing an offer of potentially all of the moving parts, right? Sometimes that can be difficult, right? And maybe the reasonable skill and care, maybe that falls under that, where there are so many variables in real estate that if you had to talk through every single potential variable that could occur on any single transaction, that might be basically impossible to do, right? But one phrase that I'm often using with, with clients is, hey, so we're talking through this offer, there's maybe three terms that I don't think we'll be using on this offer, but I just want you to know that they exist, right? I want you to know that they, they could be uh, something that you pull out, maybe on this offer, maybe not, right? And sometimes you think 
maybe the, the, the client isn't ready to make an offer that aggressive, right? Maybe they're giving you kind of the impression that they're gonna softball an offer, right? They're gonna lob something in and see what happens. And it, so maybe you say, all right, well then I'm not really gonna tell them about these more aggressive terms. And then, let's say they make the softball offer, they don't get it. Then the next offer, you say, hey, one thing we could do is include an expiration clause on this, right? Where this offer is only good for this amount of time. And you might find that they say, why didn't we do that last time? And you say, well, I didn't think you'd want to use it. And they're going to say, that would have been cool to know because I might have used it on that offer. Even if they didn't have a shot, right? They still feel like they missed out on an opportunity or a chance to use a term. So very often I try to lay out as many of the potential terms that somebody might use. So even if they're not gonna use it this time, let's say they make an offer, they don't get it accepted. Now they know that these other terms exist. And so it will help them and, and it will help you too. It will help you get an offer accepted for your client because now they're at least aware of some more competitive terms that they can use and they can begin to wrap their head around it, right? There are terms that are hard to swallow pills, right? And you could say, hey, you could put an appraisal guarantee on this where you say, regardless what the appraiser says, you're gonna pay the cash to make the difference. That's a very difficult to swallow pill. So that's something that often needs a little bit of time to sink, right, <laughs> to sink in, or somebody needs to sit with a little bit. Obviously, there's more nuance to an appraisal guarantee than that, but that will, this video will get extremely long if I talk about all that nuance. So that's disclosure. To me, putting all the cards out on the table, that's how I think of disclosure. And so if you ever hear something from an agent that's like information about a seller, information about a house where you're like, God dang it, that's gonna make them not want this house. Good, good. You you have to tell them, right? That that's not up to you to decide. Like your selfish desire to get this transaction through to closing is moot when there's something that needs to be disclosed to your clients so that you're not <laughs> screwing them over, right? So that's disclosure. And then the next up, the C of car is confidentiality. Basically what confidentiality means is that you will not tell anybody about any sensitive information, any financial information, any information that would be pertinent to negotiations, anything, any private information about your client to anyone. Even somebody who has nothing to do with real estate, right? You cannot gripe to your friends about some client who's blah, 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 which you shouldn't be doing anyway, by the way. You can't do that. And you certainly, if you did, you, sh you cannot say who they are, right? You need pure confidentiality. Everything they tell you mums the word, right? Unless there's a piece of their, that information that you think would be helpful to the negotiations, then you can say, would it be okay if I told somebody this, if I told the listing agent about maybe some of your motivation, right? And if they say yes, then go ahead. But you can't just go spouting off at the mouth saying like, yeah, you know, they're really in, in a really tight situation. They moved out of their house. They're living in a hotel. They have three kids and two cats. They're living in a hotel. They're miserable, right? That's information that you cannot just be telling somebody because then what you're doing is you're showing your card, right? So disclosure, is letting your client know here are all the cards that are possibly available to you, right? Confidentiality is saying this is our hand and, and it's not for anybody else, right? This is my hand and your hand and nobody else gets to know what any of these cards are unless you give me the go ahead to uh, show those cards. The A in car of old car is accounting. That basically means I'm gonna be good with your money, right? <laughs> I'm not gonna take your earnest money and lose it, right? I'm going to be responsible with any kind of money that I'm involved with. I'm not going to uh, give you the wrong routing numbers. I'm going to be responsible with any sort of financial transaction aspect of the transaction. That one's pretty simple, I think. It, it, but the word accounting can be a little bit weird because you're like, well, I'm not their accountant. It's like, no, you're not their accountant. You're just gonna be careful with their money. You're not gonna you know, throw their money away. You're not gonna lose their money or have them send their money anywhere stupid, things like that. Then the last one, R of car, of old car, is reasonable skill and care which I think fundamentally means 
I'm going to do my very, very best. I'm going to be competent, as competent as I possibly can. If there's anything that I'm helping you with that I don't know the answer to, I'm going to work to get an answer, right? I'm not gonna lie. You ever go to, you ever go to like Home Depot and some, you're like, yeah, I'm looking for this plumbing thing. And I go, nah, we don't have it, right? And you're like, I'm pretty sure you have it, right? Or you go to like a car parts store and you're like, yeah, I'm looking for a blinker for a, a 92 Mercury Topaz. And they go, don't have it, right? Or they go, oh yeah, here it is. And you're like, it doesn't really look like the other one I have. When you get bullshitted, right? It's, it's so annoying. <laughs> it's, it's a miserable experience, especially when you know it's happening, right? And so that whole thing of like, they don't know, they have no fiduciary responsibility to you, right? So the person working at whatever, uh, AutoZone, like they, they have no, no fiduciary responsibility to you. They have maybe customer service ethics or something like that, but that's very different than a fiduciary duty. So you can't bullshit, right? You can't just take guesses, right? You can say, this is my best guess, based on all the information I have, this is my best guess. But you can't say things as fact that you don't know are fact. This is a very, very important transaction. This is probably the largest transaction that that person has ever dealt with. Even if it's their third home, statistically, it's probably a bigger home, a more expensive home than the last one. Unless they're downsizing, well, then you still owe them reasonable skill and care. And so that's all the fiduciary duties. And I think if I just go down that, that list, I just kind of have this, this bottom one. Again, another, a bit of a North Star, a bit of a, a guiding light in the process, which is just do the right thing right? The right thing for your clients. Obviously, that's basically like what loyalty is, right? All of these fiduciary duties are basically the right thing for your client. So do the right thing for them, right? And I also think it's sort of a, a parenthetical. The right thing is often the unselfish thing for you. I've heard people say like, I work for the deal, man, right? I'm here to get this deal done. I've literally heard pretty big names say something like that. And while I understand the idea, right? I understand that like that is kind of the goal, right? Is to like bring sides together, right? I think there, there's a much more important aspect to that, which is I take care of my clients. I do the right thing for my client. And sometimes that is this deal gets blown up, right? Sometimes that's this deal gets blown up and now that client is not gonna be looking anymore. That, that's a bummer, right? Cause then you're like, shoot, man, I had a client and they're gone, they're in the wind, right? But sometimes it's just, this deal is gonna get blown up, but reassuring that client that look, that's okay. You know, you, you don't have to feel bad for me in this situation. I'm here to work for you, I represent you. If we blow this up, it's all good. I'm still here for you. I'm still gonna keep working for you. We will find you a house. There is also the scenario where sometimes somebody's gonna blow up a deal. They're gonna blow up a contract, right? On a house that they're about to get, but maybe deep down you think this is a good house for them and they haven't seen, or it's better than every single house they've seen. And that doesn't mean that you can't have conversations with them, right? That if you truly in your heart of heart think that this house could be the best house they'll see or that their reaction to it to something that comes up is maybe uh, an uneducated reaction right maybe they're afraid of something that came up in an inspection but maybe that's a really really common thing to come up in an inspection maybe it's actually not that big of a deal right maybe the, maybe the price is actually pretty small to get something like that fixed then that is where reasonable skill and care right that's where those things come into play to where the care right I care about you. I care about your outcome in this. And if you're running from something that you're afraid of, but it's because you don't understand it, then let me help you try to understand it. But if you genuinely want to blow this up, let's blow it up, right? Let's blow it up together and then we'll move on. And I think that's a really good way to make clients feel that cool. This person really is on my side, right? It's like you come back even stronger like a damn phoenix. You know what I mean? And then the last part of this video, I'm sure there's more stuff I could talk on. If you have any questions, please let me know. I, I love to answer these questions. I love when I get a, a comment on these videos that I can make a video off of. It's actually really, really nice. It helps me wrap my head around maybe like what y'all are thinking about, what y'all are worried about, uh, and even just like 
blind spots to me, right? Like, oh, that, that actually would be a really helpful video to a lot of people. So anyway, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear that. I'd love to get that in the comments. This to me, this last little bit is, is what basically I'm saying it's after a closing, right? After you've closed on a transaction, that client fundamentally is not really your client anymore, right? They are a past client, but you still owe them a lot of these fiduciary responsibilities, right? You certainly owe them confidentiality in perpetuity, but even beyond all the fiduciary responsibilities that we've already talked about, I think after closing, if something comes up, if something goes awry, that is where you can win way more than just doing a good job during the transaction. And things are gonna come up, right? Things do happen in a transaction, after a transaction, that suck. We've had people, like within a week of closing, something comes up that the seller didn't disclose. But then you have a very difficult situation of you have to prove, right, that the seller didn't disclose something, that they, that they knew about something and they chose not to disclose it. That's kind of where like that legal precedent happens, right? And so even if a client comes to you with a problem or a question, and even if you think that it's hopeless, right, that they're like, hmm, I think the seller knew about this and you're like, you're like, I understand that you think that. We, the burden of proof is on us. We would have to prove that they knew about it. That's gonna be very difficult to do, unless you know that they did know and chose not to disclose, unless you have some of those facts. But a lot of the time, they don't have the fact. They have a suspicion, and maybe there's a pretty compelling timelines, right? Where you're like, man, I mean, it seems like they must have known, right? For one, the seller does deserve the benefit of the doubt, in my opinion, in that situation, because there are things that happen. I own a house, right? Every so often, a new thing comes up and you go, damn it, okay, that's a new thing that I gotta take care of that I didn't have to take care of the past two years, right? Or if you've owned a house for 30 years, you're like, everything is good, everything's rocking. Something pops up out of nowhere. But until that happens, that's not a material fact, right? So sometimes things come out of nowhere, things change, and it's a new material fact. And so seller deserves the benefit of the doubt and you shouldn't probably approach the listing agent with an accusatory tone because I personally believe that won't really get you anywhere either. Uh, but nonetheless, without proof, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to do anything with that. But I think if they call you after closing, even if you think that issue is hopeless, that's the thing that I hear like, people say, you know, like, welcome to home ownership, that's just what it is. It's like, yeah, it, it is, <laughs> but it sucks that it happened right now. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't suck for your past client at that time. I think keep trying to solve their problem. Continue to try to answer their question. Continue to communicate on their behalf, right? With, you know, listing agent, uh, having those conversations with them, trying to communicate with vendors or something like that, if you can. I know this is kind of above and beyond. You don't have to call um, an HVAC company, right? For your past client. You don't have to, right? But you could. And I think, again, that's where you win. That's where you solidify your place as a really, really good real estate agent in that person's mind. And that's where you get more referrals. That's where you get more clients because you crushed it for that person. So just keep trying to be helpful, even after close, even in the face of adversity. There's a thing, kind of a refrain that I'm saying uh, to people on my team and just other agents who, who I talk to maybe about this kind of situation, where I believe in those situations, really what people want to know is that you are, you didn't vanish, right? You're gonna continue to work on their behalf. You're gonna continue to put in effort on their behalf and you are showing them that you are still on their team. And so if you're still on their team, then they're still on your team. And that is how you scale, right? That's how you get new clients out of nowhere, out of thin air, because they were like, yeah, you helped my friend. He said you did a really good job. So be on their team the whole time. Work in their best interest the whole time. Continue to be on their team even after the thing closed. That's all I got in this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.